Morning, everybody. Do you guys know what this series of messages is called? The Red Letter Series. The Red Letter Series? So if you don't know what this series of messages is called, it's because you must be a visitor because we've been working on this one for a while. So we, I love to speak on a series of messages that kind of has a similar tone as we kind of go through a bunch of, bunch of messages. And this one we call the Red Letter Series. And that is because, what's significant about that? Yeah, when you read your Bible, a lot of Bibles have Jesus' words written in red, just so that it's easy at a glance you can see uh, which are his words and which aren't. Just helps you to understand your Bible. That's why we call it the Red Letter Series, because we want to know something about Jesus. What was our, we started this series in November. November 26 was part one. We've been working on this one for a while. What did we say was the primary question for this whole series? Somebody said it. Who is Jesus? And we've been discovering, it, if somebody asks you that question on the street, who is Jesus? Well, he's God. Messiah. Is it true? <laughs> you can say an answer in five seconds. But a complete answer, we still haven't gotten a complete answer. We've been working on this for three months. Because Jesus is actually amazing in that we start taking little bits of things written in Scripture, of things that he said, and we we're building this understanding and realization of who Jesus is. And so today, the bad news is that today is the last day in the series of this messages. And so, I know it's going to break your heart. <laughs> we're going to stop at 15. It's not the last time we're going to talk about Jesus, but this particular series is going to be the last one. So, I want to read from Matthew 28, 18 to 20. In the book of Matthew, do you remember which book we started with in November? It was Matthew chapter 1. Do you remember what it was about? The genealogy of Jesus. We looked at who his ancestors were. So we're going to that same book again. We're going to go to the last words that he wrote in that, or that he's quoted on in that same book. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Grab your Bibles and open them up. Follow along if you want. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. That is going to be, that's where I wanted to go with this final message, is what we would call, that passage of Scripture is called the Great Commission. First of all, I want you to note that it talks about baptizing people, and so we believe, we take those words literally, we baptize people in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and we're going to be doing that again in a, the end of June, beginning of July. And I know of at least six people who want to get baptized, and we're going to have baptism right here down by the creek. And so that's going to be really good. And so we're practicing that as Pansy Chapel, but as I was holding this before the Lord and going, Lord, what do you want us to talk about when we look at this passage of Scripture? What do you want us to focus on? What's the typical answer that, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? It's actually where I thought the sermon was going to go, till not very many, not long ago. What's the typical thing that people would think about when they hear that passage of Scripture? Say it again. Evangelism. Yes, yeah, it's going to, going to the whole world, make disciples of all nations. And I thought maybe we'd talk about discipleship. What does that mean? Being a student of Jesus and so on. We've talked about that before. Important words of Jesus. And, but I realized, and we could, that would be a fantastic sermon, but I realized this. As I was reading and rereading and meditating on that passage, I was stuck on verse 18. And we're going to build an entire sermon on verse 18, which I have never done before, and we're going to have a hard time squishing it into one Sunday morning, okay? This is what it says, and if the slideshow works eventually, that's great. Is there, um, and if not, you guys are going to have to follow along in your Bibles. 
We're reading out of Matthew 28. This is verse 18. This is the whole... You need to know which verse that is because it's the entire sermon is in that verse. Then Jesus came to them and said, what did he say? You guys don't have your Bibles open. (laughs) What did he say? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. This is what Jesus said, and we're going to flush out two really key important points out of that, because when we ask this question of who is Jesus, it's a very important question to ask, because when we understand who Jesus is, it tells us who we are, because we are actually adopted into his family. We are children of the Father as well, right? And so it helps us to understand who we are. First of all, I want to talk about, in that verse 18, how much authority has been given to Jesus? All of it. And so I want to talk a little bit about the authority of Jesus. And if we want to look at Scripture for the authority of Jesus, write down with your pen there, Matthew 7 to 10. Those chapters, I call those like authority of Jesus chapters. And we're just going to go through, I'll I'll tell you, nine quick stories that represent the authority of Jesus as he was walking on the earth, okay? The first one is in teaching. In Matthew, I'm not sure, 5, 6, 7, um, there is the Sermon on the Mount, one of Jesus' famous sermons. It's long. It's at least three chapters long, but a 19 very different points, and people were heard it in one sitting. They're standing, they're sitting or standing outside on the side of a mountain. There's going to have been plenty of distractions. Jesus didn't have a PowerPoint, didn't have any funny videos to show. (laughs) He didn't get any of that. And were the people bored? (laughs) It says the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he didn't speak like one of their teachers of the law. He spoke with one who had authority. And they were spellbound. Can you imagine that? 19 points on a sermon and you're standing, sitting on the side of a mountain next to a lake. Could you be distracted? Like we didn't put windows in the sanctuary. One of the reasons is for exactly that. It's really distracting. You start looking on. Oh, well, look at the leaves. <laughs> it's distracting. And here, geez, these people were amazed. That, his teaching ability was demonstration of his authority. Second thing is, if you look, this is a, that was in Matthew 7, the end of the chapter. If you look at Matthew 8, 1 to 3, Jesus is on his way down that same mountain. And he meets a man with leprosy. What is significant to know about lepers? It's contagious. So typically, they were put banished outside of a city. You live in a cave or something with other lepers, but you don't come in contact with a clean person with a healthy person. The leper comes to Jesus and says, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus says, I am willing. And then he reached out with his hand and touched him. And he became clean. That's exceptional. I love it. It's not like Jesus was kind of, uh, back off a bit. (laughs) He wasn't scared. He has full authority. And he comes right into the face of that disease. And he says, I am willing. Be clean. And the man was healed instantly. There's another time, right next to the next story in that same chapter. We're just going to go chronologically right through that chapter. Jesus heals a paralytic remotely. A Roman centurion who is a Roman soldier. Centurion means that he wasn't bottom of the barrel. He actually had authority and could tell the people underneath him what to do and where to go. Comes to Jesus and says, this is what he says. My servant is at home, he's paralyzed, and he's suffering. And Jesus says, I'll come and heal him. And the centurion replies, this is Matthew 8, 8 to 13. The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. But just say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes. I tell that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in all of Israel with that kind of faith. 
That centurion demonstrated his faith in Jesus by understanding Jesus. Authority. Then Jesus said to the centurion, go, it will be done just as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that moment. So Jesus, the authority of Jesus is so powerful, he can touch leprosy. He's not scared of it. He can do a remote healing. He doesn't even need to be there. He can just speak it and it happens. It's already done. He didn't need to be there. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Jesus, next story in that same, this is Matthew 8, 14 to 15. Jesus goes to Peter's, Peter, Peter's mother-in-law's house. And she's got a fever. Yeah, she's sick. He touches her on her hand and her fever is gone. This is, what, this is the authority of Jesus. Next story, he casts out demons with a word. That evening, people were bringing demon-possessed people and sick people to him. He healed the sick. He cast out the demons. He, he did that all by speaking. He spoke a word and it happened. And then if you keep on reading, Matthew 8, 23 to 27, he rebukes the wind and the waves. Jesus is on a boat with his disciples. He falls asleep. And this furious storm comes. And the disciples are panicking and say, Lord, what do they say? Lord, save us. We're going to drown. Exactly right. And so then Jesus wakes up, rebukes the wind and the waves. And the disciples were, they were amazed. They were afraid. And now they're afraid of, of Jesus, actually, because he just told the wind and waves to be quiet. And even they obey him. That's the authority of Jesus. I want to make a point here. Have you guys ever been in a storm? The other day, like, uh, I think it was on Tuesday or something, it was windy. For about 20 minutes, really windy. Were you guys, anybody outside doing that? It wasn't raining or hailing or nothing, at least not where I was, and it was windy. And even in that moment when it's really windy, it becomes a little bit intimidating. Can you imagine being in a furious storm with rain, wind, and you're on a lake? There's consequences inevitable. This is not going to go well. You can't even talk to the next guy because it's too loud and furious. This is just like Satan. He's got, a lo he's got a loud bark. But under the authority of Jesus, how much bite does he have? That's right, because Jesus has the authority and he says to the wind, be quiet, be still. And it's still. Satan's like that in our lives sometimes, in our lives sometimes isn't he? Where things seem like they're furious and he's, it's pretty loud. That actually isn't anything for the authority of Jesus, is it? Then we keep on reading, we get to this place where the demons submit obediently. Jesus is walking along. And he sees two men over there that, have, that are demon-possessed. They have become so violent because of those demons that nobody can pass that way. But here comes Jesus. And the demons, you know what? When he gets close to those two men, you know what? The demons start shrieking at him. They actually start speaking out of the mouths of those men. The demons start speaking to Jesus. Would you like to have been there? <laughs> Would that be intimidating <laughs> at all? It'd be awesome. It'd be a little terrifying. And you know what it says? The demons were terrified. And you know what they shrieked to him? They were scared. The demons were terrified and said, Have you come to judge us before the appointed time? Something like this. I just paraphrase. What does it say? They were terrified of the torture before the right time. Isn't that a curious thought? These demons were terrified of what they knew was coming. But then Jesus said something to them and they obeyed. Jesus said, go, and they went instantly. That's the authority of Jesus. Those demons don't follow Jesus, but when he speaks, he has the authority. When he speaks, they obey. He says, go, and they went. Amen? 
there's another, two more things I want to point out, but I want to pray first. I'm not sure if it's me or if it's May Long Weekend, but there's, let's just pray. Lord, I invite your Holy Spirit to come and stir within us. Jesus, help us not to just be words that we're saying and words that we're tolerating for 20 more minutes so that we can go home. Lord, let this be a time where we actually become awed about who you are. Holy Spirit, I invite you into this place to work it right here in us, Jesus. Stir in our hearts, Lord. Tell us, reveal to us who you are. Just like we sang, Lord, we want to know who you are. Amen. Do you guys want to know who Jesus is? <laughs> so in the same passage, Jesus says, does something really interesting. Some men bring him a paralytic on a mat. And Jesus says, better read it so I don't misquote it. Jesus says, take heart, son. Your sins are forgiven. To which the Pharisees said what? That's blasphemy. Why is that blasphemy? Only God forgives sins. Knowing their thoughts, this is Matthew 9, 4 to 8. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? Which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or to say, get up and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, get up, take your mat and go home. Then the man got up and went home. When the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe and they praised God who had given such authority to man. That's the authority of Jesus. He heals, but not only does he heal, he can forgive sins. He's God. You guys with me? Then in Matthew 10, he does something absolutely amazing with all of his authority. Matthew 10 verse 1. Somebody with your Bible open, tell me what does Jesus do in Matthew 10 verse 1 with his authority. That's quite fascinating. Say it louder. Matthew 10, 1. Yep. Yeah. He's been driving out the evil spirits. He's been healing people. And now he gives authority to his disciples. He takes his authority of, of God and gives it away. Doesn't give them the authority to forgive sins, but he gives them the authority to do some pretty cool things. Do you know what they are? If you look down at verse 8, four specific ones there. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, and drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Would you have liked to have been in <laughs> that group of disciples? <laughs> Guys, why is this a tough question? Jesus, I, what's going to park here then if we can't get past it? Jesus says, heal the sick, raise the dead. Is this going to be exciting? <laughs> Man, I'd be pumped to go to funerals. Hey? <laughs> heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those with leprosy. Can you imagine going into a hospital where somebody is behind a glass cage because it's contagious and you're just like, let me in. You're going to die. No, no, Jesus said Cleanse the lepers. That's what he's talking about here. Drive out demons. This guy's demon possessed. You probably don't want to go there. No, no. Jesus said, I'm going. He gave me his authority. I'm here on the authority of Jesus. Get out of the way. <laughs> That's what Jesus says. It's amazing. What's mind-blowing is that if you think that those kinds of things are only for the 12 disciples, if you look at Mark 16, it actually has a similar list of five things. And he says, these signs are going to follow everyone who believes. Whoa! <laughs> are you a believer? <laughs> not sure? Uh, if you're not sure, come and see me. We get, we're going to be praying after the service. Gladly chat about that. 
Oh, man. And did Jesus have incredible authority? I want to point something out. What did Matthew 18 say? Matthew 28, 18. Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth. So Jesus had a lot of authority. Would you agree? What's the next part of that verse? He, Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been? That's fascinating. What did that say? All authority in heaven and on earth has been? Why is that fascinating? Let's think about that for a second. How many gods are there? One, One God. But he, we know from Scripture that he's actually represented in three persons. They are? Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth but it has been given to him. What? Je Jesus isn't the top authority? No, then he, he was somebody gave him the authority. If somebody gives you authority, you are not the top authority. You're reporting to somebody else. You are submitting to someone else. You are subject to someone else. You're beneath them, as it were. If you drew it in a line, you'd be beneath them. If it's true that Jesus was given the authority. That is an amazing thing about this. And so when we think about the Trinity, the Trinity is hard to understand. Our, our human brains can, can actually not fully comprehend the Trinity. There is only one God, but he is represented by the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Three persons. And in that, as Jesus was quoted in Scripture many times, and the New Testament is full of explaining this point, Jesus did not put that authority on himself. It was given to him by the Father. Let's, let's dig into this a little bit. Well, first let me ask you a question. Do you, have you ever felt sorry for Jesus because he had to submit to someone else who had authority? Has that thought ever crossed your mind that you felt sorry for Jesus for that reason? Like, honestly, that thought has never crossed my mind. I've hardly even thought about the fact that the Father gave it to him, but nowhere in my Christian life have I ever th felt sorry for Jesus because he was only given the authority, and he constantly had to submit to the Father. I never felt sorry for him. Why not? I'm not sure. But are you like me in that when I have to submit to an authority, ooh, man, that is like a burr in, under my saddle. That's the only reference I'll ever make to horses, okay? <laughs> but that doesn't sit well with me. Can you guys relate to that? This might just be a sermon for me, but when I have to submit to authority, it's tough. Because I naturally want to elevate myself, and I want to be the authority. Jesus, in his relationship to the Father, gives us the perfect example of what it, that looks like in a relationship. Full submission and full surrender to someone else who has authority over you, and yet it's so good to be in that place under that person's authority that someone looking from the outside never would feel sorry for you. You can have submission in a relationship, and from the outside, you'd never think it's a bad thing. We have turned that into being a bad thing today. We have somehow heard that word submit, and instantly, man, you mentioned that in a marriage sermon, half the people there are offended. Maybe they're all offended. Jesus submitted to, to the Father all the time. We're going to dig into this a little bit. This is common knowledge in the, in the New Testament. But I want to point out this bit by bit. Jesus, who was equal with God, Philippians 2, 6 to 8, John 1, 1 would say the same thing, submitted himself under the Father's authority, and he became, there's a word that starts with O, what is it? He became obedient to the point of what? Death, even death on a 
cross. Jesus, who was perfect, died on a criminal's, a criminal's death. The only man ever to walk the earth who was innocent died as a criminal, humiliated. Shame and humiliation were his because he was in submission to the Father, although he was the only person who ever deserved praise and honor. Why have you never felt sorry for him? He was, he was living in submission to the point of humiliation. The authority that Jesus had was given to him. This wasn't easy for Jesus, but he never stepped out from underneath that umbrella of authority. He never stepped out of the underneath that. That was the Father's responsibility, and Jesus never left that and said, forget it, I'm going on my own, I'm going to elevate myself and give myself the name above every name. That doesn't come out of Scripture. You don't read that in Scripture. God gives him that name. It's amazing. John the Baptist knew this in John 3.35. The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in his hands. Those are words from John the Baptist. John the Baptist knew that the Father was giving everything to Jesus, but he understood that order. That is actually amazing. Paul knew about it. This is almost a complicated verse to read, but 1 Corinthians 15, 27 to 28, Paul actually makes this super, super clear. Listen to what Paul says. For he, and then it's in quotation marks, because he's quoting the Psalms, for he has put everything under his feet. Now when it says that everything was put under him, it is clear that this doesn't include God himself. Who, puts, who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him, so that God may be all in all. Paul's making it clear, the Father gave Jesus this full authority, but at no point does Jesus supersede the Father. He's always in submission to the Father. That was 1 Corinthians 15, 27 to 28. Ephesians 1 says the same thing. Jesus himself is quoted many times throughout the Gospels that he is constantly in submission to the Father. In John 5, he says this. This is how it reads. For this reason, this is John 5, 18 to 19. For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own Father, making him equal with God. Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly I tell you, the Son can do nothing by Himself. He can do only what He sees His Father doing, because whatever the Father does, the Son does also. That's it. Jesus says, I'm just going to mimic the Father, because I'm submitted and surrendered to the Father's will. Who's, in the, who's the authority there? The Father. And Jesus is intentionally surrendering to his authority. But you're thinking, Delan, isn't Jesus the ultimate judge? Sure he is. Listen to Jesus' words, John 5.30. Same chapter. By myself I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear. And my judgment is just. For I seek not to please myself, but who? Him who sent me. He's desire when he's judging, he is the judge. But in his judgment, he's still pleasing the Father. The one who sent him. It's like the Father. Man, if I was to paraphrase, I hope before the Lord that I'm not way out of my theology here, but it's like the, it's like the Father told Jesus, Jesus, you're going. And Jesus became obedient and went. Jesus says this in John 6, 38. He says, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of the one who sent me. The Father sent Jesus to go down, to become a human, to become obedient to death, even death on a cross. 
John 8, 42, Jesus said, these are Jesus' own words, I have not come on my own, but God sent me. Those are amazing words. He came out of obedience to the Father. I want you to think about those words. Kids, I'm going to park over here. There's kids everywhere, but I'm going to park here for a second. Do you ever feel bad for yourself because you're supposed to obey your parents? You feel like, oh, woe is me. I'm going to obey my mom and dad. See some shaking heads. That's a good church answer because I know what you guys do during the week. <laughs> the next question will be then why do you disobey? But we actually feel a little bit, sometimes we feel it's a burden to obey mom and dad. But we've never felt sorry for Jesus, and he just said, he obeys. Remember how the crowds were amazed at Jesus' teaching because he had authority? Look at John 14, 10. This is, these are Jesus' words. Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Even the words that Jesus speaks aren't his. This is amazing. He actually is just fully operating under the Father's authority. Jesus never takes credit for even his own words. And his teaching was amazing. And even Jesus, when the crowd says, you man, you're amazing, he says, no, no, it's the Father. These are just the Father's words. All I'm telling you is what the Father wanted me to tell you. At the core of Christianity, who is eternal life found through? Who do you have to cross through to to get to God? Jesus. We all know that. And even eternal life, the eternal life that Jesus can give us. Listen to how Jesus describes it. John 17, 1 to 2. Now in verse 3, he's going to say, now this is eternal life that they may know you. Okay? But in 1 to 2, he says, after Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. Verse 2, for you granted him authority. Jesus' words to the Father said, you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. The eternal life that we get through Jesus is still under submission to the Father. You see what I mean? At no point does Jesus ever pull out from underneath that umbrella of the Father's authority. That's amazing. Jesus is in constant submission to the Father. If the Father wants to give him the name that is above every name, then so be it. Even though Jesus is equal with God, and that he is God, he didn't consider that something to be grasped, but he purposely put himself underneath the Father's authority, and then it was through Jesus' obedience Willing obedience. That's where eternal life comes from. And that is the reason the Father decided to give him the name that is above every name. And that is the reason, we just sang this, that is the reason every, name, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. Because of where the Father put him. So, in the Bible, there's another example of someone else who, who operates a little different. And this, this uh, person that Isaiah 14 talks about is described a little bit like this. That person is described as saying this, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne. I will sit in the seat of authority and I will make myself like the Most High. It's Isaiah 14. Who are we talking about? That particular person, according to verse 14, was cast down to earth from heaven and brought down to the depths of the pit. In that passage, it's fairly clear that that person was trying to elevate themselves to being God. Which is the one thing that Jesus would be qualified to be able to do because he's equal to God, but he never did. This being tried to do the same thing. Who do you think we're talking about? It seems pretty obvious that we're talking about Lucifer, Satan, the devil. Jesus says in the New Testament, he says he saw Satan fall from heaven. 
Then we talk, let's talk a little bit more about Jesus' life. In Matthew 26, 39, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, in this olive grove. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and he prayed, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Was that a fun moment for Jesus? To be fully surrendered to the, Lord's, uh, to the Father's will? No, <laughs> that was obedience. That's what that was, obedience. Father, really? Are you sure? Is there any other way? Out of obedience, I'm going. What about Pilate? Did he have any authority? This is exceptional. You think it's exceptional that Jesus is, is constantly under the authority of the Father? But so much so that he even has to, because he submitted to the Father, he has to, even has to bend to the authority of, of Pilate, a man who is carnal, who does not understand who Jesus is, doesn't understand that he is perfect and that he is God. In John 19, Pilate says to Jesus, Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said, Don't you realize that I have the power to either free you or to crucify you? And Jesus answered, You would have no power over me if it were not, were not given to you from where? From the Father. I submit to the Father. That's why I'm here. That's what he's saying to Pilate. You actually have no authority. I have all authority under, on heaven and, in heaven and on earth. And the only reason that you're going to condemn me and allow, I'm going to allow you to crucify me is because the Father said this is the plan. <laughs> Are you guys catching the example that Jesus is actually an incredible example of submission? And authority? And that he was given the authority. He didn't muster it up on his own. It was all from the Father. This clear submission of Jesus to the Father is a demonstration of perfect submission. We can actually, if you want to know what that looks like in your life, I could point out four areas in your life where this might become really practical. <laughs> One is the government. Scripture is really clear what Christ, how Christ's followers should behave towards the government. They have been given authority. There is no authority except that which God has given. There's authority of the government. There's authority in families. Oh, man. Parents and kids, there's an authority structure that's God-given. Kids are supposed to be under the authority of their parents. That's a biblical concept of authority. Husbands and wives. It is a biblical concept for a wife to be submitted to her husband. Jesus, we never feel sorry for Jesus submitted to the Father. Why is that? Because the Father is amazing. <laughs> He loves his son like you have no, We can't even describe how much he loves Jesus. We, don't ever, we have never felt sorry for Jesus. <laughs> Jesus says to the... Jesus, the scriptures tell husbands how to live. Just like Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Under that kind of an umbrella, it is not hard to come into submission. Nobody would ever feel, nobody feels sorry for somebody who is submitted to someone else. Nobody feels sorry for a kid who grows up in a home that's a good home. And that kid is supposed to submit to their parents. My parents were, were weak and human. But you should never feel sorry for me. Because I think I grew up with the best parents ever. And most of the time, I was submitted to their authority. <laughs> but, I'm, but I'm a bit of a re rebellious at nature, and so there was a few times that I needed to repent. But anyway, uh, you don't have to feel sorry for me, even though God told me to submit to my parents. Because if you knew my parents, 
you would think, Delane, you had it pretty good. I did have it good. We don't have to feel sorry for people who are supposed to submit. There is an, the third area is in the church. There is a clear mandate from Scripture about submission and authority in the church. Elders and deacons have varying levels of authority. And there is an authority structure from Scripture where there are leaders who are going to have to give special account. They're going to be accountable to God for things that happen underneath them that other people will not be accountable for. And there's people underneath them that are accountable to them and to them and to them. This is a biblical concept of church. It's not without intention that we follow that kind of a model in Panther Chapel. We've drawn it out on a piece of paper. If you came to the membership explanation meeting, we, this is, we explain what we're, what we're doing and why. And it's not a power trip. It's a God-given example. There's another one, community. I could point to you scriptures in, in 1 Timothy 6 and 1 Peter 2. We could study this all morning. And I could point out there's two specific places in the community where you should be under, you're under other people's authority and you should submit to them. Coaches and teachers. Those are two that I'll pick on. If you're playing sports and you have a coach, that's your authority. There should be a submission. Just this last week, I heard a kid kind of lip off to his coach and I thought, man, that kid has not been trained according to Bible standards. Or teachers in school. There's an authority in structure straight out of Scripture that Jesus is a really good example of. And then if we come right back around in Matthew 8, we looked at that story when the centurion, the Roman soldier, comes up to Jesus. We went over it before. Why did Jesus say that that man, he had such faith that Jesus had not seen that kind of faith in all of Israel? Why? Because he understood Jesus' authority. I'll read it for you. The centurion replied, and first of all, I should ask this. Do you feel sorry for, when you see a, a soldier, a centurion, who comes, he comes in with the, his battalion or whatever you call his group of soldiers that follow him, and he tells them, go do, take five guys, go over here. You take four guys, go over here and do this and this. Report back to me. And they go out and obey. Do you feel sorry for the guy in charge? No. I don't. We kind of look at his position and go, wow, that's kind of prestigious. We kind of want to be that guy. But listen to how Exactly that guy talks. He says, the centurion replied in Matthew 8, verse 8 and 9. The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority. The centurion was acknowledging to Jesus that, listen, I'm a centurion. I have a bunch of soldiers under me, but that doesn't mean I'm the top authority. I also have to report to a higher authority. And so these things that I'm telling my soldiers to do aren't just whatever I make up. I'm taking orders from above and then saying, go and do. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, he goes. I tell that one, come, he comes. I say to my servant, do, and he does it. And to that answer, Jesus said, wow, that kind of faith I haven't seen in all of Israel. So when we're thinking about this whole series of messages that we started back in November with what was the primary question? Who is Jesus? Jesus has been given, Matthew 28, 18. Jesus came to them and said, how much authority? All authority in heaven and on earth. He has complete authority. Has been given to me. He has complete authority, but even in that complete authority, he still surrendered to the Father. That's who Jesus is. When we understand, this is important to understand because when we understand who Jesus is, how much authority he has, that he is still surrendered to the Father, and we understand that example, what are the next two words in the Great Commission? 
Therefore, go. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> do, you, do you see it? This is who Jesus is. Full authority. Submit it to the Father. When you understand that, good. Then go. And then start making disciples. That's the key to understand that. Let me just close in prayer. Jesus, oh Lord, I love you. Some of the things that I read in Scripture boggle my mind. On one hand, you are almost hard to comprehend who you are. And then I read Scripture and I see things that maybe I didn't even pick out before. Jesus, as I contemplate the authority that you have and the example that you left us when you submitted to the Father your entire life to obedience on the cross, help me to walk out that kind of submission to authority, especially to you, Jesus. It is to you that we surrender. Amen.